Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Sapien Podcast. Today, we have our good friend, Dr. Matthew L. Bloom, who's going to talk to us about physical medicine and a bunch of other good stuff. Dr. Bloom is a PM&R doctor. He specializes in musculoskeletal medicine and rehabilitation. He, um, wow, we learned so much on this podcast. He talks about how to avoid arthritic pain, how to avoid chronic back pain. He teaches us about injections like platelet-rich plasma and stem cells. He talks about a modern approach to healthcare, a preventative approach to healthcare. He is extremely aligned in his approach to healthcare uh, with me and Brian. He is a brilliant guy. He is uh, so knowledgeable. And I think uh, everyone will learn something from this podcast. I think he's got a lot of uh, more information to share with us, but I, I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this. Yep. And I'll just let everyone know how this podcast is possible. It's because of sapien.org. And this is our company. This is what we and Gary are doing with our lives is what we believe in. We have the Sapien program as one of our offerings where we help you change your life. If you're serious about making a change and you don't know where to start, we got you. Even if you do know th these principles, if you're listening to the show and you know the Sapien diet, it's not easy to just do it. You need some help and we got your back. We have a series of videos. We have a 10 week course with a compendium. We educate you on everything from macros to fasting to uh, how to buy food. We, it's it's an all encompassing course and it's really exciting uh, and we're really proud of it. Um, we also have something called the Sapien Tribe. Uh, it's really a community. Um, we have a special podcast that we do for that. We have Zoom calls with me, with Brian, with our health coaches. And what we try to do is motivate you, support you, and build a community because it's the only way you can su succeed with all of these changes. Well, we're making a tribe. It's an online tribe. We have a private members area. We're trying to get people to interact, to help each other, and build a tribe from around the world. And that's what we've done. So you can find both of those at sapien.org. And uh, when you're trying to find good quality food, you can go to nosetotail.org. This is an amazing uh, food delivery service. Uh, Brian has partnered with regenerative agriculture farmers, um, providing the highest quality meats. We're providing grass-fed, grass-finished beef, pasture-raised pork, omega-3 high chickens, among a whole variety of other things I can't even begin to <laughs> touch on. Uh, my favorite product is uh, the, the beef tallow. If, you're, if I'm going to be honest with you, it's so high quality. It's so nutritious. It's so delicious. I use it almost exclusively for all of my cooking. Um, and it's amazing. Thank you for that. That yeah, that's nosetail.org, and yeah, that's that's my company. We we only do our own things here. I also want to promote Dr. Gary at EvolveHealthcare.com because he's basically the best doctor I know in LA. Stop. <laughs> no, I, I I just referred to someone on on Instagram right now because they they always ask me where do I go for a doctor that gets it, and they can never find anyone. And I always say Dr. Gary. EvolveHealthcare.com. If you're in Los Angeles, or even if you're not, uh, you can do remote visits. Absolutely. And without further ado, here's Dr. Matthew L. Bloom. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Sapien Podcast. We're here with Dr. Gary and our good friend, Dr. Matt Bloom. We all went to UCLA together. What's up, guys? How's it going, guys? Welcome, Matthew Bloom. Can I tell you how excited I am to have this guy on the podcast? Um, I'm really excited for everyone to learn about what Dr. Bloom does. Um, he's one of our best friends, uh, and he's one of the best physicians I know. Um, Dr. Bloom is a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, a lot of people don't know what that is, so I want you to tell him about it. But just in general, he specializes in your musculoskeletal health, joint pain, uh, back pain, um, you know, muscles, bones, ligaments. This is what this guy does. <laughs> He's a specialist with rehab medicine. Um, one of the smartest guys I know, Matthew, thank you for having us here, having you here, <laughs> having, being here with yeah, us. I'll go ahead and say that part. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for having me here today. I'm excited to be on the podcast and to join you guys. I've been watching your guys' work now for the last uh, few years, and it's really impressive to see where you guys have gone with uh, with this uh, platform. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think in a very short period of time, you mm -hmm. guys have done a tremendous job to uh, 
bring great information to the masses, and uh, I'm one of those people. So it's a pleasure to finally be able to put this together and work it out with our schedules. Uh, but I think one thing that really brings us all here together, you know, how we've sort of progressed over time to get to this place is this idea about promoting health. And I know for Dr. Schliffer and myself, uh, Dr. Gary, Gary's patients just call him Gary, which is crazy. <laughs> By the they way, come to me and they're just like, Gary. And I'm like, Gary who? I'm like, is he a doctor? And they're like, oh yeah, Dr. Gary. Okay, yeah, now I know what you're talking about. I'm casual, except yes. this was the first time I've ever <laughs> called Matt Matthew. Just right now, the or first doctor, time ever. Probably, or doctor, Or said my last name, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, so, uh, but what's brought us here together after all these years, uh, you know, starting as good friends at UCLA and, and kind of growing up um, into adulthood is uh, is this idea about trying to uh, help people get healthier. So when I was really young, I was big into physical fitness and, and health and training and working out and things like that. And uh, and that's, you know, probably one of the places that we first interacted mm -hmm. with the most was just, you know, throwing weights gym. around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Buddy lightweight, all that stuff. So um over time, we've come to this place, which is pretty tremendous and amazing. Uh, but again, this idea of promoting health, and it's why Gary and I went to medical school, and it's why Brian got so involved in uh, nutrition and health himself in the last several years. Uh, so traditionally in our medical system, the concept is allopathic in nature. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, misnomers in terms of uh, medical definitions and terminology. It's very complicated. You know, most people... Uh, it's an entirely different language. Even in medical school, they yeah. present it as, you know, however, tens of thousands of new words. It's Most like, people listening don't even have an idea what allopathic medicine is. Right. So, so that's kind of why I started with that. Exactly. Both me and Dr. Bloom are osteopathic physicians. We were trained uh, regular Western medicine strategies, but in addition, we had extensive training in uh, manipulating the body using various techniques. And really, Matt, your profession is sort of the specialization of that of Absolutely. that modality that we learned. Correct. Yeah. So uh, the allopathic model, MD traditional model has only existed really uh, since the turn of the, you know, the last century. So around uh, 1900 time, basically the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and that was, you know, typically these barbaric uh, approaches to medicine. Oh, somebody's leg is injured. Let's uh, take them to the barber and cut their leg off. And I'm oversimplifying things, but I'm doing it for a reason uh, because we've evolved uh, tremendously uh, as a culture and species and society, but we still philosophically take the similar approach to many things that we do, especially in medicine. And osteopathic medicine has a different philosophy or approach to how you take care of patients. And it's more holistic in nature. Uh, and, you know, those are some, again, some terms that kind of can get misused. Um, alternative medicine is, is another word that I don't like, but has sort of been, uh, you know, colloquialized to be the common terminology for somebody who doesn't practice what everybody else is doing. And uh, so ultimately, when you're looking at an osteopathic physician versus an allopathic physician, an MD versus a DO, they're both equally licensed to practice medicine. They have all the same practicing rights. But as Gary mentioned, you get an additional training that gives you sort of a different philosophy about how you approach things. And that approach to uh, treating patients and ourselves and everything really in life, it applies to uh, farming, uh, food sustainability, everything comes down to that philosophy. So I like to kind of start broad and then we can kind of pare down into the details of what we're going to discuss today. Well, yeah, allopathic medicine is treating the symptoms. It's it's kind of these interventions to try to react to the problem. And what we're trying to, you know, I, I don't like the term alter, alternative health either. It's, yeah. it's fun. It's root cause medicine. It's the foundation of the what caused the problem. And that's what you guys focus on more. Gary's more the internal side. Matt's more the physical side. And so that's why it's great to have you on to talk about the physical side and how do we prevent disease? How do we never get sick in the first place? And if we do, how do we do it naturally without just prescribing a bunch of things? Yes, very well said. And I think a lot of it is uh, is the diagnostic approach, right, Gary? It's sort of uh, not just looking at the symptoms like you just said, but really kind of trying to figure out what is the underlying cause of what's wrong. So uh, I don't know what direction we want to go with this now, but you know we have all different yeah, platforms I mean, that we can utilize to make uh, analogies or examples of this kind of stuff. I think the diagnostic approach, uh, absolutely, what you're saying, but but just you kind of me, you got me thinking because I never really thought about the fact that we both happen to become osteopathic physicians. Neither one of us were ever like, I'm going to be a root cause medicine doctor. I'm going to do more <laughs> lifestyle medicine. I'm going to become obsessed with nutrition. It just sort of happened. And yeah. 
you know, our relationship with Brian just sort of happened. We were, we were just friends. And I think it's, it's interesting because in a time where people really are becoming really disillusioned with the pharmaceutical industry, uh, disillusioned with insurance companies, uh, you know, with, with public health guidance and sort of the recommendation system that exists. It's pill popping. Pill so. po- you know, and even just <laughs> recommendations that are archaic, right? Yeah. To, uh, to share in an approach of treatment, right? Not just a, but treatment that is outside the box. Mm-hmm. So we say the word alternative, but really we're just, we're just not buying into exactly what was sold to us. Yeah. We still do what was trained. Like you were trained to do certain injections. Yeah. You were trained to use certain medicines. But you also realize the extreme benefit of other interventions and other modalities that might not have the double blind placebo control study to support it, but is clearly like a meaningful intervention. So I do think that like, and that's a good point. That's another misnomer, this concept that only evidence-based medicine can be applied, right? If we operate within such a narrow context and window, then we are eliminating so many other possibilities for things to provide benefit to people. Well, it's funny because we're not going to crystals. Like, you know, the, yeah. you know like there's the, people sometimes <laughs> they think that. alternative health, they're like, oh, we're going to use crystals and faith healing with their hands, not even touching you or something. Yeah. But there's a whole spectrum of things that Matt, Dr. Matt gets into that is somewhere in between. And it's very evidence based too, in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, I can get into some of that stuff. It sounds like a decent transition for me to kind of explain a little bit more yeah. what, what I do. Tell, but yeah. tell us, like, what... So I think of you as a specialist in musculoskeletal medicine. And when I think about that, I think about manipulating the body. So I know you do something called osteopathic manipulative therapy, OMT. Yeah. I know you are highly, highly trained in injections, things like PRP, stem cells, and other sort of injectables, which I really want to learn about today. Um, I know you do electrical studies, something called an EMG. So... So it, for for someone who's just listening right now, they've like, what's a physical medicine doctor? Like, like if you could give us a two sentence like synopsis, I don't even have a good one. Yeah. Well, uh, neither does the uh, American <laughs> Association of PM and R doctors because mm-hmm. even their synopsis is about a paragraph long. So, uh, you know, part of the reason I like the specialty though is because of how general it is. So a lot of the things you mentioned are just parts of it, and so that was one of the things that appealed to me was having a variety of skill sets and modalities and. Uh, knowledge to be able to take care of patients in a more comprehensive and holistic way. So I think that that's part of it. Ultimately, again, that kind of underlies what the specialty is about. A little bit of the history, though, the specialty kind of developed post-World War II uh, after uh, the trauma from the military injuries, including uh, brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. Prior to that, there was really nobody who existed to take care of that. So that's sort of the rehab perspective built out of military hospitals. How do we take care of these soldiers who have these gruesome injuries and, you know, maybe would historically have perished in the battlefield or without antibiotics, but with the development of, you know, new medicines and technologies, they could survive. But then how would they thrive after? or even just exist in general. So that's sort of the the origin of it. But it's really developed over time into a broad field. And um, I like to think of myself as a non-surgical orthopedic specialist. So when you mm-hmm. think about orthopedics, you think about bones and joints. I heard you say that earlier. Mm-hmm. And that's definitely a lot of what I do. Um, but I'm doing everything I can in a non-surgical setting, right? So worst case scenario, patient needs surgery, I'll send them to you know, a trustworthy surgeon. But ultimately, I'm trying to prevent that from the outcome. So... Uh, ways to do that. So uh, ultimately, I do blend the two things you mentioned, Gary. So in the osteopathic world and DO school, we learned uh, osteopathic manipulative treatment. uh, And that allows me to use my hands to sort of diagnose and treat various musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, So uh, in our body, we have uh, multiple layers, you know, we're 70% water, we have fascia that covers us from head to toe, if you dissect a corpse, uh, you know, and you look at uh, these tight layers of connective tissue fascia. They literally go from a continuous line from your skull all the way to your feet. Okay, so think about that. Think about the interconnectivity of our body. Think about how that attracts and creates flow of the 70% water in our body. And then think about all the other anatomy and structures, the bones, the joints, the ligaments, everything is all interconnected. So that's the osteopathic philosophy. The allopathic philosophy is my injection techniques. Okay, so I learned how to use musculoskeletal ultrasound. I learned how to use EMG, neuromuscular skeletal medicine, to diagnose nerve muscle 
injuries, et cetera, and then treat them with various injection types. So the injections are more allopathic. That's sort of like, okay, you have arthritis. Let me put a joint uh, injection in there and help your joint feel better. And I think a lot of people know about that. And I really want to get into the details. But before we jump to it, you know, for someone listening, one of the, you know, I always try to think like, how, how does this apply to me? And so if you're a person out there who's got joint pain, if you're struggling with back pain, if you're having numbness or tingling or weakness in your arms or your legs, um, a lot of the time when you go to a doctor, it's here's pain medicines, here's muscle relaxants, uh, go see physical therapy, then go see orthopedic surgery. And I think so many people listening will resonate with that because that's just like what yeah. we do. And and what's been so great about working together and, and so many of my patients are just so happy is rather than jumping straight to uh, drugs or surgery, right? I have someone I could send you to that can do a thorough job diagnosing. So using everything from physical exam to imaging, integrating those to really get down to like, what is the problem? Mm -hmm. And then creating sort of a, for lack of a better word, an integrated approach to treatment, which includes rehab, physical rehab, whether it's your hands, whether it's a physical therapist's hands, whether it's a patient at home, you know, doing their own thing and then incorporating things like injections and drugs in a more thoughtful way. And I think that that's where we're the same. Like I give that kind of integrated approach for metabolic disease, obesity, diabetes. You give that sort of integrated approach for joint pain, back pain, neck pain, even things like fibromyalgia. And I think that what people need to, what I hope people will take away from it is that it's not about like alternative versus Western medicine or, you know, I'm an integrative or functional medicine doctor and I do food as medicine or I do this. It's more like being educated and, and understanding all the layers and then creating that customized experience for the patient. And I think very few of our colleagues are doing that. I, I always say when you go, like when I send someone to ortho and I send someone to whatever specialist, I often say like, if you go to the candy man, they're going to give you candy. That's mm -hmm. what they do. They give you, they only have candy. You don't go to the candy man and they give you a steak. That's not what they do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I really like, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, proud of our approach because when patients come back to me that have seen you or like my patients, that's what they are saying. They're like, wow, I've never had a thoughtful approach. I've never had like this is what's going on. This is what might be going on. We can go A, B, C, D. I think we should do this mix of all three. And is that because we're osteopaths? Is that because we, we are red pilled with Brian Sanders and, you know, realize that there's more to it than what we were educated on? It, is I it think who earlier, yeah, you, you said something and it kind of sparked my mind. It's sort of like we figured this out on our own, right? If you're in this allopathic model, uh, the traditional medical model or the traditional uh, health recommendations about nutrition, and you're looking around and everybody's sick and unhealthy, like, what's going on here? I don't think that it would make sense to continue down that path, right? It's, so that's sort of the light bulb moment, right? Where you're but like, not many people have that light bulb. That's why I think we woke each other up in a way, or we just had our own path and we got to it on our own, but it just sucks that not everyone has done that. Yeah, well, what? I think, yeah, maybe it's just the system is so uh, ingrained that it's difficult to get information out in another way. I mean, I feel like there's that struggle there constantly sometimes, like where, you know, colleagues just aren't seeing the things the way they are. And you realize how many people that they're interacting with and sort of uh, propagating the same uh, message. Um, but, but as an example of what you said, I think you definitely laid out very well that idea of, uh, you know, you fail a few things at the front end with your regular doctor and then it's off to surgery. Right. Okay. And in the past, that was part of why uh, your pain medication became so popular from the 80s and then especially the last two decades, ultimately culminating in the uh, opioid epidemic, as, as sad and devastating as that been in the last 10 years, especially. But that was because uh, primary care doctors didn't have a better modality to offer their patients. They didn't have better treatment. Their patients were feeling better with pain medicine for multiple reasons, whether it's physical or emotional or mental. And that sort of propagated that industry. And then on the surgical side, 
Uh, I think you're right. It's like a point and shoot mentality and you know, that's what they're good at, but there's this massive gap that's missing in between. And I experienced that firsthand with close family members. It's ultimately what inspired me to switch from business into healthcare and to go get a medical degree along with, uh, Gary's tutelage, uh, back then. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so I think all those things you said were really, uh, well thought and, and well stated. And I think that they really highlight some of the issues. And now if you take it another level, we're in an era where pain medicine is no longer mm -hmm. deemed to be appropriate. So uh, a few years ago, because of the opioid epidemic, justifiably so, the FDA came in and said, pain medication is not indicated for chronic pain. And typically- Which is obvious. Pain <laughs> is obvious, right? There was no research on it. The research was flawed and uh, it was you know, misleading providers, et cetera. Well, even yeah. beyond the research, just- simple logic. Like if you have this <laughs> thing, you can't just mask it forever. It's just going to get worse. I mean, I remember when I had my overuse injuries, they wanted to, they, they tried to give me the, the pills, the Oxycontin or the yeah. Tylenol. I was like, wow. are you kidding? Do you think I'm just going to take even just Tylenol or Advil every day? How is that going to help? That's just going to mask the pain and I'm just going to keep using the computer and it's going to get worse. So from a simple logic point of view, it's just absurd for chronic disease or Absolutely. chronic pain. Sorry. Yeah. And now that's not even really a viable option in most settings. You know, most people nowadays are not even going to be offered pain medicine because doctors are liable and things are, you know, it's against the law for various reasons. So, so there's even a bigger gap, right? I mean, not that it was a, a smaller gap for the right reasons, but mm. the gap exists even more. So, so definitely that's where I try to, to provide uh, options. Right. And so traditionally, uh, you know, getting into you know, various injection models, you know, traditionally, uh, cortisone or steroid shots, I think, you know, most people know somebody who's had those, or maybe have had one of those themselves. And that's what's covered by insurance. That's a standard of care. Um, it's cheap, it's effective. It's again, it's a short term fix It masks your pain temporarily, but it doesn't solve the problem the majority of the time. And after your pain, uh, after the medication wears off, and your pain comes back, it's usually worse and there are usually more problems. And okay. the side effect profile of steroid injections is pretty scary too. Potentially, absolutely. It's not as bad as taking steroids by mouth or IV, but by the way, people get that all the time. People are prescribed uh, oral steroids or given IV steroids in the hospital constantly for conditions that don't necessarily warrant it. You know, we practice this like emergency style medicine in all contexts of life as if everybody is dying all the time. And then you freak people out with a virus and now everybody thinks they're going to die all the time. I mean, it all kind of lines up with everything. But, uh, you know, that's not the way we think. And that's not what we want people to uh, get in their care or how they you should feel on a regular basis. I mean, to me, that's absurd, like you just said, Brian. So, uh, you know, I think beyond the cortisone, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, in an ideal world, I remember when I trained with a doctor and he goes, you know, I hope after residency, you never inject a single person with cortisone ever again. And I mean, that would be amazing. You know, if, if I'd ever had to use cortisone again, I'd love it. But it's just not necessarily feasible in an economic it's a time and place. OK, so I have a cortisone story. OK, so even in high school. So it's not maybe it's not all the side effects are just the side effects of it. It's the side effects of you getting hurt. So I was pole vaulting in high school and I had shoulder problems, and they were gonna shoot me up with cortisone so I could do in the state championships. Band and Band-Aid, the ultimate band -aid. Yeah, and they said, we could shoot you up and you can do the state championships, but you're gonna, might hurt yourself because you're gonna mask the pain. You, so that's a bigger side yeah. effect is you mask the pain because it's numb, basically, yeah. or and then something comes or worse. Some other shot to numb it up temporarily. I mean, that's yeah. the classic story of uh, these pro athletes, right? You know, they're basically uh, property and they get put into a position to make money for other people and they risk their own health and livelihood. And we see the repercussions of that, uh, you know, constantly nowadays and, um, and reporting about, uh, athletes and how they're doing now. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting. And I think there's even more nuanced models of that too, where you have players who are, uh, getting particular surgeries to help them recover sooner from an injury so that they can get back on the court or the field sooner. But ultimately that surgery puts them at risk of a further injury mm -hmm. down the road that could either shorten their career or, decrease their quality of life in their thirties and forties. We're talking about, cause these are pro athletes that are, you know, operating at a high level. So, you know, those people are making millions of dollars. Maybe they have a different thought process. You know, I've never been in their shoes, so I can't say if I'm going to get $10 million, maybe it's worth it to me. Um, but you know, that's another thought, not just with the cortisone, but the steroid and, and, yeah. uh, surgeries too. 
Well, there's a lot of money in my high school pole vaulting. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and also I see it. I see it with the weekend warriors too. You, oh yeah. You have you know I have plenty of guys in their 40s and 50s that are you know they're playing ball every weekend and they're hurt, and instead of dealing with the issue, losing a few pounds, cleaning up their diet, doing some real rehab therapy, some cold therapy, some like just like rehab physical therapy stuff. No, th they're they're taking. You know, they're Tylenol and ibuprofen. They'll get an injection here and there. They'll go see like a ortho or a pain medicine doc, get an injection here and there. It gets better. You know, six months later, it's way worse. Yeah. And and ultimately, you know, it's it's all I think it's ultimately part of the, mm -hmm. the plan. I mean, not necessarily the plan in a you know, like medicine, evil, like to make evil money. Way, yeah. yeah, but it's just it's part of the system. Right. So we're yeah. talking about these guidelines and recommendations are made like for Brian, for your industry, right? Yeah. Who makes these health recommendations? The sugar industry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sugar is good for you. I went to a, uh, mm -hmm. what is it called? A sugar farm, sugar cane farm or whatever. Yeah. I forgot what they're called. And they had a video on loop saying how there's no evidence that sugar causes diabetes <laughs> right? and how sugar is good for you. Yeah. And I mean, it's just kind of the crazy. So, so it's like in medicine, it's like, okay, uh, well, we want prescription companies to make lots of money. So we're going to make people dependent on prescriptions or vaccines or whatever it might be. And then for surgery, it's the same thing. It's like, let's give them a placebo treatment with a short-term effect, with a long-term detrimental impact that lines them up for this surgery that they're eventually going to need. You know, this whole approach and back to like what you brought up, which is our kind of integrated approach. And we're trying to help people heal and, and, and not just sort of palliate or, or treat a symptom, right? You know, I think about how is it, you know, how is it that we got here? Again, is there something about us? Is there something about our training? Is it our friends? You know what I think it is? Um, I think that academia lives in this echo chamber where everyone is echoing the same thing. And most people in uh, like physicians, many of the physicians we know and many academics, many people in the health and nutrition space, dietitians. Th they're surrounded by the same people they trained with. And it's just like this circular thing. People like dietitians, you know, like in our space, dietitians that talk about grains are being healthy. They just keep saying that to each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when you get into the ortho space or, or the joint space, it's like a circle or conversation about injections and, and, and biologics. And, you know, it's just like drugs, 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 inter interventions, interventions. And so what what it took for us to step away from it is not being in an echo chamber, is having someone like Brian. And I brought this up on many podcasts and mm -hmm. Brian's always very humble, but having someone who's not a doctor, who's very, very smart to challenge you. And when you get mad, which we both got mad, <laughs> go like, it's okay. You could be mad, but like, think about what I said. And, and that kind of discourse, that kind of like respectable <laughs> Dis disagreeing with respect is what drives people to be get better, you know? And I, so again, thank you, Brian. Uh -huh. yeah, no, I, do, times, I remember but it's very important. Uh, when I was in residency oh, and yeah. I called Brian or Brian called me or we were talking or whatever, and we had this long conversation and Brian sort of like had this crazy vision about, um, you know, sort of getting into nutrition. And then, then he was telling me he wants to get into like agriculture and farming <laughs> and like have this, you know, have like his own food. And I was like, dude, like, what I think I even called about? it Sapien back then. You might, have, yeah. I mean, you. I have think I already had the idea. Was, uh, probably in maybe 2017 or something. So I yeah. mean, you've done obviously in just three years, just this major yeah. thing, really quickly. Um, but you know, because obviously, nose to tail dot com dot org dot org uh, <laughs> is Brian's food line now. The the so bomb. yeah, so I mean, it's amazing that you've been able to do that. But yeah, I do remember now that you bring it up. I think I remember calling you about it. I mean, like, who is this guy? <laughs> no, this guy's a. Had Freaking unemployed engineer. No offense, Brian, but I was yeah. like, how is he going to shape like healthcare or like the health landscape away from like pharmaceuticals and like traditional medicine? And I was just like, you know, because I did, I did an MD residency, first of all. Right. So it's like, I learned all this stuff with my hands and then I went to MD residency. And they're like, that stuff doesn't work. It wasn't that it didn't work, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. Yeah. You know, again, it's like, what is, what are you focusing on? It wasn't the focus. It was okay. I didn't go there for that. I went there to learn these other things that I learned and take that out of it. But at the time I was in an MD setting and you know, these other things were not as on the forefront of my mind. And so, uh, 
Yeah. So thank you for reminding me of the time that I got mad at Brian. <laughs> well, Brian proved me wrong. So <laughs> it's just, you know, we've heard about echo chambers. I, you know, nothing I said was novel, but uh, again, I think we're so blessed to have a close friend group that is willing to disagree. Um, I think more recently those disagreements have been a little bit, uh, <laughs> off the rails a little bit, a little off the rails, but I think from like for our, for our medical practice, like, I mean, again, we, we both have private practice by the way, let me congratulate Dr. Bloom <laughs> on going fully independent. He's now got his own private practice, his uh, growing beautifully. I'm very, I'm very, very uh, excited for you, proud of you. Uh, keep rocking it, dude. Thank you, sir. But I mean, look, like in order to do what we're doing, private practice, kind of generate our own treatment plans, um, integrate what we've learned with like what we continue to learn, right? I think it really takes someone in your head, like someone on the side being like, like our friend Alex, who's in our, in our head about politics, which we're not going to get into. But my point is <laughs> when someone opens your eyes to a different way of looking at things, someone that you respect intellectually and, and you have history with as a friend, it's so powerful. And I think like the podcast, like Brian's podcast does that for a lot of people. They're like, Hey, I respect Brian. He brings a lot of great content. So when they hear new doctors and people on your podcast mm -hmm. or on Sapien podcast, they like, listen, you know, th this whole podcast community is that for a lot of people. Yeah. And we're lucky to have that just like within our community. And I think it's shaped our practice dramatically. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the things that we look at, right. So you're talking about this kind of integrative approach. And I do really like that where I think functional medicine is a is a decent terminology too, and that's relatively popular. Uh, but I, I think it's like looking at the same stuff, but in a slightly different way, right? So uh, as an example, I'll, I like to use you as your guys' example more than mine, but I'll, I'll go into a couple of mine. Um, but first, you know, with you guys, it's like you look at labs and the labs will say, okay, this is the normal range. And then, you know, you'll have a patient and the patient's unhealthy. You're like, oh, but your labs are normal. Right. So you're like uh, a normal doctor would be like, yeah, no, you're fine. Like, you're good. Like, you know, like I'll see you in a year. And you're like, but well, but the patient is like not feeling well. They're like having other symptoms. They're nonspecific, but they're all, you know, affecting their life uh, adversely. So, you know, wh what's up? The, the, these labs, they can't be telling the whole story. So, you know, you guys run different labs and they look at other things or things in a different way, maybe even the same labs, but you interpret them differently. And then you say, okay, well, maybe this supplement will help you. And, and a traditional doctor would say, well, why would that supplement help? Their labs are normal, right? And of course we know this in the vitamin D model, you know, with, uh, with COVID now, especially mm -hmm. with the normal parameters being uh, insufficient, uh, magnesium, other things like that. And so in my field, I'm sitting there looking at cortisone shots and saying, this can't possibly be the best thing mm -hmm. that exists out there. No way. That's something that lasts on average six to 12 weeks and makes a patient worse after is the best possible thing that they can get. Well, so going back, you, you kind of lumped in the other type of injections, PRP and yeah. stem cells into the allopathic model. And I don't think they are the allopathic model. So if people listening don't know, they probably heard some of it, you know, PRP is platelet. Well, I'll let Matt yeah. discuss it, but it, yeah. it, I don't think it's not like cortisone. So you tell us the difference. Yeah. And Brian had experience with one of the practitioners, the one who I mentioned, you know, I hope you never do the cortisone. Yeah. Again, I mean, that guy's like a multimillion dollar doctor in Brentwood. <laughs> so, you know, he's in a little different situation than a broke uh, resident. But uh -huh. anyways, um, you know, I think, uh, I think he's right. Ultimately, you know, I think if you could get away without ever doing cortisone, you know, 99% of people would be better off for it. So tell us the options. I think yeah. we've been beating around the bush here. We're setting it up. <laughs> what is what is PRP and stem cell injections? What's the difference? Sure. Just, just yeah. that, basically. Yeah. So it's a regenerative medicine model. That's a very common term, or orthobiologic. So you're using biologic substances in an orthopedic setting. And regenerative is a little bit of a misnomer, but I think it gives you the idea that you're kind of regenerating or regrowing the tissue. That's definitely the ultimate goal, right? Is uh, let's say you have a breakdown of a tendon or a ligament or a muscle or bone in a joint or cartilage in a joint. You're ultimately trying to reverse that, right? So we were kind of an anti-aging concept, reverse aging model. Uh, but ultimately what we're actually trying to do, I think this is the best way to say it in a single phrase is we're trying to promote the body's natural ability to heal and repair itself. Okay, so in no way did I say we're growing anything new. Mm -hmm. In no way did I say we're reversing the signs of aging or anything like that. I said that we're taking an injury and we're letting it heal naturally by using the body's own ability 
to heal and repair itself. That if you just take that one sentence away from from what I can ever instill in somebody, I think that's the most powerful thing. Because cortisone doesn't do that. Most mm -hmm. other things that are out there don't do that, right? Pills now, don't do that. Correct. Yep. Exactly. So the most common things don't do that. So what can we do for that? So stem cells are a really hot topic. Stem cells is something that, you know, we could talk about really forever, but mm -hmm. they're more popular. Well, can you just tell us the difference? We take it out. You get your own plasma out of yeah. your body. We yeah, didn't even get that Tell us about what is the difference between PRP and stem cells? Because sure. I do think most people have heard those terms. Like, define well, them. What's the difference? I think most people have heard of stem cells. And mm -hmm. most people have, that's why I like to start with stem cells. Then I'll kind of pare down. But I, stem cells are what most people have heard about. It's on the news. It's, it's reported. I, you know, I, I saw not too long ago, um, Good Morning America or one of those morning shows, and they had uh, Christopher Reeves' son on there speaking about a miracle stem cell transplant procedure that helped a patient, you know, basically walk again, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's honestly the context. It's like a miracle cure. You know, people that get cancer, they fly all over the world. They pay exorbitant amounts of money to get these stem cell infusions, and they think that they're going to basically fix everything that's wrong with them. Okay. So... You know, again, what Brian mentioned earlier, okay. um, right. So that's the thing is so, and Gary, Gary wants to know, I think mm -hmm. he does what genuinely want to know, uh, <laughs> but so of course not. Right. So nothing's that extreme, right. You know, I've yeah. seen ads like 99% cure rate with my stem cell procedures. I mean, look, nothing in medicine is that good. Um, and if you, if you talk to your doctor and your doctor tells you that something's like a hundred percent or close to it, I would probably go find another doctor. There's very few things in, in, that exist in the universe, let alone in medicine, <laughs> yeah. where we barely know anything about the human body. That's 99 to hundred percent accurate. I mean, that's just illogical as Brian said earlier. Mm. So what do we have? We have something in the middle, right? Let's try to be nuanced, moderate practitioners and just people in general. Um, do stem cells work for various things? Uh, yes, there are obviously applications that are appropriate. Um, you know, certain cancers respond well to stem cell transplants and things of that nature. Uh, in my field of musculoskeletal medicine, there are some early indicators that stem cells may help for certain conditions. Okay. And I'm going to speak to my specialty. I'm not really going to generalize it or speak to other specialties. Uh, there's a lot of nuance to stem cells. So stem cells are where you sourcing them from. Uh, as Brian said, with the platelets, we take it from your own blood. I'll get into that a little bit more lately. Stem cells, are we taking it from the person's body or are we taking it from a outside source? That's a huge differentiation. That's honestly step one. Mm -hmm. If somebody's telling you they have stem cells, you where say, are stem cells coming? where are they coming from? If they're not doing a, a bone marrow biopsy to get those stem cells from yourself, I'm already highly hesitant to even consider that as a so, legitimate so stem not, cell treatment. So uh, not when it's not your own stem cells, you're saying it's not effective or not a good idea? Almost in every sense, almost, almost in every case. And, and <laughs> I mean, the there other... are scenarios, again, I, I don't know how much detail we want to get into, but I think that's a good general rule. What, the other sources being like fetal stem cells yeah, so or umbilical, like grown umbilical? You know, there's some, uh, some fat stem cells that may have some applications that we're learning more about. So that, you know, but again, that's coming Harvest from your own from, body. Oh, your own From body. your body still, right? So, um, so stem cells that are coming from another source, uh, typically a bad batch, if you guys have ever heard of this, but this is a story of a stem cell company that came out of San Diego that was producing uh, non-sterile stem cells that were not live stem cells. So they were stem cells sourced from fe fetal tissue. They weren't even packaging them in a sterile fashion. And when they were eventually studied after a bunch of disasters happened, there weren't even any evidence of any live stem cells in the products that were mm. being injected. So not only were they um, infected with bacteria that caused serious infections for patients, but they were never gonna work in the first place. It was all placebo. Wow. And so this idea that fetal stem cells, you know, you could take these stem cells from like a unborn fetus or, or an umbilical stem cell, so taking it from an umbilical cord of a, of a, of a mother uh, and then injecting it into your veins and being superhuman. I think that's pretty bogus. So. So I'm should I should not I should not fly down to South <laughs> to Panama. America and Panama uh, and I, get I mean, all of that. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Maybe, maybe you know I haven't explained it well enough or or given you the bad reasons, right? Because in medicine it's do no harm. So one thing we do is stem cells are are they have the ability to depending on the type. But if you have a, a true naive stem cell, that stem cell can differentiate into any cell line. So imagine you inject something into your bloodstream, and where does your bloodstream go? All throughout your entire body. And you've got something that you've injected that can mature into anything it wants. 
Okay, does that sound safe? Again, let's <laughs> right. just. I mean, that's what cancer is. Cancer is unchecked cells growing yeah. out of control. Yeah, you and your it. body being under. Unab- well, no, this is the this is what's alarming because I think we're in this biohacking community, and and what you're talking about these injections. So think about it. How can you guarantee that that injection yeah. is going to go to the place that's messed up? And it's going to do, it's just going to like get some signals and the signals are just going to tell it to do the perfect thing that it's supposed to do. So, so, and, and one thing we didn't mention, uh, for people listening, so there's, there's stem cells. So we talked about the source of the stem cells, whether it's autologous. So from yourself body, yeah. or hetero, uh, hetologous so from somewhere else. And then secondly, there's systemic infusion of stem cells yep. versus local localized. infusion. So what I do is localize. So what I was sort of like there, yeah. hinting at is this idea that just injecting stem cells into your vein and letting it go everywhere in your body, you know, that's a really questionable thing. What you're doing for regenerative joint injections is actually local injection of stem cells. Yes, that's so I just important. wanted to clarify that. And that's true of anything, right? So if you inject something locally, your side effect profile, if you do a cortisone shot into a joint or you do an IV steroid infusion, the effect on your whole body is going to be drastically different. And it's the same concept here. So now uh, with the research on stem cells for musculoskeletal conditions, there are some kind of class three, class four level evidence studies that show that it may be useful in certain potential pathologies, musculoskeletal pathologies. So arthritis, uh, tendon injuries, et cetera. Specific joints? Uh, typically the knee has the best response. It's a large joint. The way the joint is formed allows it to heal better. There's just various things about the anatomy of the knee joint. So most of the studies on arthritis are on the knee joint just because it's the easiest to like treat. low hanging fruit basically. In comparison to some of the others, right? Yeah. Um, so what's happened is, is we've sort of utilized, and this is true of PRP, we've sort of utilized some decent studies in PRP. There's better evidence, which I'll get into momentarily, but there's better evidence for PRP in musculoskeletal conditions uh, in more cases and more examples. But we've sort of extrapolated some studies to say, like, let's say we've got a class three, four evidence study for knee arthritis that seems decent. So we'll say, okay, well, we can apply that to other joints too, maybe. Or we've got a PRP study that was really uh, high. Uh, it was a double uh, placebo. Double blind placebo blinded control blinded, study, excuse yeah. me, yes. Um, with really good quality evidence for tennis elbow, mm-hmm. which is a tendonitis or tendinosis, a chronic tendonitis of a elbow tendon. Which is a very common, a lot of listeners are. Yes, most people have tennis or golfer elbow on the other side. And, and so we've extrapolated that to apply it to other tendons too, right? Like we can use it for a rotator cuff tendon injury and various other things. Although the evidence for those other things is realistically not as good. But in comparison to stem cells and PRP, most of the time there's better evidence for PRP. And so to me, there's more utility to it. And the people who I train with in regenerative medicine typically use this ratio of about 95 to 5. So they use PRP about 95% of the time and stem cells about 5% of the time. So another red flag, if you go to a practitioner and all they have are stem cells in these little vials and they don't know what PRP is. And those stem cells are not autologous. And those are bogus in the first place. What I'm saying is, so if they're using the worst quality stem cells and they don't have PRP, then what, you know, you shouldn't be there. I had a lady come to me, $12,000 on stem cell hip injections, 0% better. Now she's seeing me, I'm doing PRP on her. PRP. $500 Five hundred to a thousand dollars, and it will actually help. Really quick, though, we didn't describe platelet-rich plasma. Okay, let me. Let me yeah, about that's that. what so, I was just gonna say. So that's um. So Brian had this a long time ago. Uh, you know, hopefully this is a HIPAA violation, but um. <laughs> so platelet-rich plasma. So we take whole blood from. We just do a blood draw. You go, you know, you go to the uh, hospital. You go to the doctor. They do a blood draw. We do the same thing. A simple blood draw in the office. We take your whole blood. And then we put the blood in a centrifuge. So it's just a kind of like a techie, spins like a it science. It just spins it super it's fast. It's like so the Gravitron from yeah, our... Yeah, it just spins it <laughs> horizontal, like really, really fast. And and it, it creates different layers of the whole blood. So the different types of cells in the blood layer out. So you've got white blood cells that help fight infection. You've got platelets that are involved in uh, the clotting cascade or when you injure yourself to prevent bleeding and things like that. And then you've got red cells, which carry oxygen. Okay, so... Uh, it was determined that the platelets have various proteins and growth factors that can help places that are damaged heal. 
And I think the reason that this came about was because when you injure yourself, I always use the example of a sprained ankle. If anybody's ever sprained their ankle, what happens when your ankle gets sprained? Obviously it hurts, but it swells swells up, up, swells up big time, right? So you got all this blood, all this swelling. So so what's happening, right? So your body is trying to heal your injury. It's sending a bunch of blood to the area. And in that blood are platelets. And the platelets are part of this cascade of this healing response. So that's, again, a natural response. So Good what, inflammation. Kind of. Good, yeah. So that's what I was, exactly what I was going to yeah. say, Brian. Is so, so what do we do in our you know, uh, infinite wisdom when you sprain your ankle? You go, my ankle hurts, so let me put ice on it. And let me take anti-inflammatory mm-hmm. medications to prevent this natural healing. You know, because it hurts. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. It hurts. You want to fix it. If you do your, you sprain your ankle once, you're usually okay. You know, you just kind of, okay, I sprained my ankle, it gets better. You do your stuff for a few days or a few weeks and you're good. However, if you've got a, an injury that's developing chronically, so over months or years, and it's from repetitive overuse, so let's say you sprain your ankle every three months for five years. Mm-hmm. Well, holy crap, now you're in a whole different situation, right? Because you're not even healed anymore. There's no potential there for healing. And especially in tendons, Tendons are really poor in their own vascular supply. So that means that they have a really poor ability to heal themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a rotator cuff injury like Brian had, uh, or I have, uh, or a lot of people have, then putting more cortisone in there or uh, taking more anti-inflammatories eventually will provide zero benefit. And in fact, it will set you up for what? Surgery, because everything else is failed. Mm -hmm. So we have the ability to take blood from your arm, centrifuge it or spin it, isolate the platelets, take the platelets out, and then inject the platelets back into an injury site. And those platelets have various proteins, growth factors. They create a natural immune response, various immune modulators. More, We can identify maybe a dozen of them, but there's probably hundreds if, you know, just more than we even know about. And that is what helps an injury heal naturally. So we're sort of uh, simulating the body's normal natural healing response in a place that is either too damaged to heal on its own or has a inability to heal itself. We're like amplifying it. And I remember after it was super sore yeah, for a couple so, of days. That's the crazy thing. Is, yeah. You know, when I do a cortisone shot, I put a lidocaine in there and the patient walks out, they feel great. They think I cured them. I'm like, a, you know, I'm my best guy. Then the, you know, the lidocaine wears off yeah. and they're like down the street and they're like, what'd that quack do? Mm-hmm. And then the cortisone takes a few days to kick in and then they come back and three weeks they feel great. Then in three months they feel bad again, right? Mm-hmm. But with the PRP, I warn them and nobody, you know, nobody gets the warning, but I'm like, you're going to be worse in worse pain after this. Oh yeah. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt worse than you normally hurt. And then... You know, they, they still, they still call my office. You know, they still text me. They're like, I'm in so much, I'm like, I told you it was going to hurt for two or three days. Like you were going to be in more pain, but what's that doing? That's the, that's the swelling that happens when you sprain your ankle, but that's, what's healing it. So, you know, I know it's a hard concept to grasp, but that's the reality of what we do with this type of modality. I, uh, I am obsessed with this concept and paradigm of using acute stress to heal chronic stress. Okay. And the idea that we have been basically trained to tell people to rest, so to heal their chronic stress, and it doesn't work, and they just get worse and worse and worse. And so this is a perfect parallel. When you have this kind of injury, this kind of chronic injury, and you're like, here's something to make the pain go away, rest, and it doesn't get better. It gets worse. But here's an acute stress. Here's a PRP injection. It's going to hurt more. It's going to be uncomfortable. But the outcome is your body is now triggered to elevate itself and do better. And now the chronic stress is suppressed. Uh, so it's exactly like fasting. Mm-hmm. It's exactly like high intensity interval training to hack your hormone system. Uh, cold immersion therapy, heat therapy, deep breathing. These are like the what I tell my patients about. These are cr- acute stresses you can use to build your body stronger. So in a way, what you're describing with PRP and stem cell injection is you're inducing an acute stress that will heal a chronic stress. Well, it's like, like it. I call it acute inflammation to c- cure Yeah, so it's pro-inflammatory. So mostly everything is anti-inflammatory. Everything in traditional medicine is anti, right? Antibiotics, anti-inflammatory, yeah. anti- They're just trying to treat the symptoms, yes. Right, so in this case, it's pro-inflammatory. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that is a difficult concept to grasp. Okay, this so. is why it's so difficult, because- there's a huge difference between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. So most people have chronic inflammation or they're chronically just okay, like alcohol. If you chronically drink alcohol, it's just going to keep wearing down your liver and it can never heal. Mm-hmm. But acute, if you have alcohol once a year, that's fine. 
That's okay. you, you, right. It's like so. It's the same type of thing almost because it's a disturbance to your body or it's some this inflammation. But there's such a difference when it's every day compared to once in a while. So that's why yeah, it's confusing because it's it, it could be bad if it's every day, but it could be good if it's once in a while or used the yeah. proper way. And again, I think that applies to my sprained ankle example. If you sprain your ankle every once in a while, it's probably not that big a deal. But if you're constantly injuring your rotator cuff day in and day out with maybe your work or you're putting up 85 pound shoulder press or yeah, exactly. No <laughs> Yeah, I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, to your point, yeah, that's the kind of thing that will eventually create more of an issue in the long run. But for, that's why the, the record, overuse injuries. For the record, 85 pounds in each arm. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> in case that was about was like, 15 years ago, yeah. though, so I will lift about Strong five. Strong guy. I think I got here. five pound dumbbells. I have had a hard time finding heavier <laughs> ones during well, the pandemic. So <laughs> that, to kind of sidebar, like um, uh, me, and, me and Matt used to lift weights together and... Uh, we got pretty into it <laughs> and Matt, uh, as he's been alluding to, got a little bit of a shoulder issue there <laughs> Still and <have> it. <laughs> kind of backed off and, and figured out how more safe way to do it. Yeah. In medical school, I, I rediscovered weightlifting and got really excited about it and, um, did just that there's super heavy shoulder press and <laughs> I gave myself really, really terrible, um, subacromial bursitis. Yeah, so, so the one. kind of padding below my shoulder and, it was, it was terrible. I wish I had, uh, you know, some of these strategies that I've yeah. developed and, you know, it kind of leads me to this. I think we've, you know, I have so good about the stem cells and the PRP, all these things I didn't know about. Um, how much has like the lifestyle stuff, uh, bled into your practice? I know you're still growing your yeah. private practice and, and obviously bread and butter is going to be, you know, your manipulation and your injections and your intervention. I mean, you're an interventionalist at heart, right? right? Yeah. But how much at this point and, and, and also well, as maybe a not, maybe I'm an interventionalist by trade, but by heart. Right. I think, you know, uh, I think I'm definitely coming back to it. You know, I think, uh, as I mentioned, I went through my medical school, uh, training and then residency and residency was, it was a very MD oriented, um, although my specialty does sort of lend itself to kind of like a yeah. holistic approach anyway. So that's definitely why I liked it and went into that field. Um, but then, yeah, I kind of in more like a traditional orthopedic model now. But um, now that I'm going to be branching out, uh, the things that you guys have really grown in your uh, careers with over the past couple of years are things that I am definitely hoping to uh, expand upon in my new practice setting. And regardless, these things are unavoidable. So the things that you mentioned that patients suffer from are unavoidable. If you're a good practitioner and you sit there and you look at your patients and you touch them and you listen to them, I think is probably the most important thing that I do, then all of those issues that you brought up are always there, but we ignore them traditionally. We just poo poo them. We push them to the side. We focus in on our little narrow window in our little tiny box of things that we can do. And that's the interventionalist approach. And that's ultimately not how I practice anyways. I mean, I do these injections, but I do them in a way that is, uh, encompassing of all these other elements of care. And so I think patients naturally will gravitate to people like you and Brian and myself, because we offer, what they're missing in the rest of their uh, healthcare. Well, here's one way to think about it. I'm thinking of like a Venn diagram and the allopathic metals on the models on the left and they're using all the interventions and surgeries. And then the crossover is some of these interventions like injections and uh, physical yes. therapy and stuff like that. And then over the right is a preventative. And that's what we're talking about to stop the joint pain and arthritis in the first place, which is a whole untapped resource that you're getting into now and that crosses over to us where it's like, why do you have arthritis and joint pain? Some people, yes, it's because I play tennis every day. I get it, okay? But some people, a lot of people we're finding out, it's because they're eating grains every day, and maybe they don't do well with grains, and we're finding out a lot of people maybe don't do well with grains. Maybe or everyone. Yeah, or, <laughs> or sugars. Efficient in various other uh, you know, minerals or other things of that nature. Or, or you can't build ligaments vitamins. With, without eating animal products because the cartilage cannot be <laughs> You have be no generated. collagen. Yeah, yeah, if you're eating no collagen, you're eating all, like plant-based diet, your body can barely produce its own collagen. Yeah. And so that's why these athletes are having all these injuries that are vegan. So Hashtag Kyrie Irving. <laughs> Cousin or uh, Cam, Cam Bam. Cam, Cam Newton. So he still looks like a... This is, this is like the huge... <laughs> 
the huge part that uh, you're getting into now and more, I think, physical medicine people will get into is the diet matters. And that so many people in my world, they're like, I, I changed my diet and all my arthritis went away. Well, and this, and this, this definitely applies to one other uh, aspect. Uh, you know, I, I kind of talked about the different components of these uh, regenerative medicine procedures, right? We didn't even talk about technique or other things like that yet, um, which you probably won't have time to do. Uh, yep. But the application of general health, we're taking people's own blood or stem cells and we're using them as a treatment modality. How do we know that it's a quality source even if it comes from their own Yeah, like what if they're so sick and their own plasma yeah. and stem cells are sick, right? So that has to be part of the conversation, by the way. You know, if, if you're injecting somebody that has poor quality platelets because they're in this chronic inflammation state. Or they're boozing all day. Or they've got other underlying mm -hmm. health issues from various Diabetes, things. Diabetes, hyperglycemia. So then, you know, you have to have, again, none of this is something that you just do all the time because you, it works. It's like you have to have a nuanced approach and you have to weigh all these factors and elements. And so it, it applies in this sense too, you know, and everything really, like you're saying. Some other questions, because I think we all agree that the diet is this heart of it. And um, if, if, you know, you're listening so it's to this diet, podcast. diet, sleep, stress, exercise. Yeah, I Those think are the about primary components. Yeah, I think mind. about like I always say uh, I add sun to it. That's what I add. So okay. I, I I say movement. Okay. Movement because exercise can be scary to people, and I think movement is enough. And I got a good one for movement. I heard this at a conference, but I loved it. Motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. <laughs> motion and 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 what I add to it is mm -hmm. if you really want to get yourself there and know that you're doing a good job, make sure you're sweating. If you're if you're doing something to the point where you're sweating, you're creating that acute stress that your body's going to respond to. Okay. Uh, sleep, obviously, sleep hygiene. If you've never heard that term, please Google it because it's like incredibly please, important. Please Google sapien lifestyle. <laughs> Nutrition. If you don't know what sapien lifestyle is, I have no idea what you've been listening to. I have no idea where you're. <laughs> How are you even here? Yeah, first what are you even doing? <laughs> well, first time. Yeah, maybe. Well, sapien sapien diet, guys. Um, Stress management, so doing something for yourself, hobbies, family, kids, dogs, uh, reading, all the stuff that's stress management. And then sun. I do add sun because sun is a way of really bringing up the vitamin D discussion. And, you know, it should be mentioned on a podcast where we're talking a lot about bones and health. Uh, vitamin D is a pro-hormone. It, it, it affects all of our body systems. It is not just important for bone growth, which is very, very important for your bone health, but it's important for your mood and your gut and, and your, your gut microbiome. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like a hormone. It's like testosterone or, or thyroid hormone. It, it affects everything in your body. So, um, and, we're and we talk about prevention, right? So those are, those are, you know, how you do, but why are you doing it, right? What's the, what's the goal of prevention? The goal of prevention is to prevent you from uh, putting an unequivocal amount of stress in some way in your body that outweighs its ability to bounce back from it. Right. So when you talk about guys that are weekend warriors, and I know these people, they're running marathons every week or they're power lifting in their 50s when they've already got multiple injuries, you know, th th that's a mismatch. Right. We've got an obvious mismatch. When people go, why is there swelling in my joint? I go, because you're you've injured your joint to the point where your body can no longer manage the damage you're doing to it. And so it's getting inflamed and swollen and painful. Um, and so all those components are but, but, you know, I, I think we could even break those down a little bit more. Obviously, with the vitamin D, the sun exposure, there's there's the right way to do that. There's the right way to supplement. The diet is a big deal. But but the exercise thing, I think, is a big deal, too. And, and this is stuff that we've lived through ourselves. A lot of it is personal trial and error. But it's like, yeah, when I was younger, I used to lift a lot of weights. And it was great. I could handle it until I couldn't handle it anymore. And then I started getting injured. And then it's like, okay, well, what do I need to do next? And I had a herniated disc, and I found yoga. And then now yoga is, like, a great balance um, you know, generally men are more bulky, they lift more weights, they're less mobile and flexible and women are typically more hypermobile, but they're not as strong. So Pilates is a great balancing act for women on average. This is not a sexist me too thing. I'm just, mm -hmm. in, you know, oh, generally weird. biological stuff, right? Here, yeah. Exactly. And men, I recommend yoga too. You know, uh, most men have back pain. It's like, um, okay, we'll lose a few pounds, uh, in these various ways. Um, move more, move in the right ways. Don't put undue bad stress on your body. I mean, these are preventative things. I know they may sound really simple and oversimplified, but they're the heart of everything. Ultimately, they're the, the tenants and the core of what you can do to really promote good health and then prevent injuries from recurring or prevent worse things from happening to you over time that may actually require more serious interventions that, again, I don't want my patients to have to go through. 
I want to throw something in because you're talking about yoga. I've never been into yoga, but I should. But it's about, I mean, it's about being stretching, being more mobile. Because most people, I, I'm into doing the opposite of what you mostly do. Yeah. It, opposite position. So most people are curled forward. So I have the... Yeah, I have the overuse injuries. Yeah. I'm curled forward. Pronator. I was on the computer. A pronator. Yeah. Pronator, yeah. right? I'm everything's Classic. forward. Your shoulders are rolled Prop. forward. Your neck is rolled forward. So even if you don't do yoga, I I went through physical therapy for years trying to heal from this. Do the opposite. Go in a doorway. Open your body. Yeah. Open. Everything's the opposite. Lie on the the rolling. Uh, yeah. That foam roller. And I'm looking at you like this, and it's like meditation, right? You have this stress and this uh closed mindedness of being what does meditation do it opens you up right mm -hmm. it's opening your mind it's helping you opposite therapy what is there a term for mind. it Oppo it's like do the opposite of what you normally it's do the anti anti <laughs> anti anti it's it's so answer. important it's, and yeah. and one thing i wanted to add to this whole concept all of these preventative strategies uh the ways to prevent injury, physical injury, ways to prevent disease, metabolic disease, uh, all of these strategies build resilience. Hmm. So everything we've talked about, and what was the great guy talking about the probiotics on your show? K Kiran Krishnan. Kiran Krishnan. He is so eloquent. I highly recommend listening to it nice. on Peak Human Podcast. Mm -hmm. He's right. great. And he talks about this idea that what we're trying to do is build resilience. You're going to, you're going to have wear and tear in your back. You're going to have, if you want to play ball, you're going to have issues with your ankles and your knees. You're going to be exposed to the flu. You're going to be exposed to the flu. You're going to yeah. be exposed but to sugar. I don't get the flu, but I'm exposed to it. But you get exposed to it. You don't get sick from exactly. it. Exactly. Because you have resilience. Yeah. So it's this idea that when you said like preventative strategies are the heart of it, it's because they build your ability to bounce back. Yes. They And so that when you do get an injury and you go to Dr. Bloom and he injects PRP into your joint, you've got really healthy plasma. You've got really healthy blood. Your, your cellular health, your mitochondrial health is super strong. So when you're using that regenerative modality, you're actually injecting the healthiest your product. Benefit, yeah. And that's all driven by preventive. There's no drugs for that. No. There's food and lifestyle. That's it. And, and I think that that's where we all connect uh, and we're so passionate about. So we don't have a lot of time. I want to ask you, Matt, you've shared so much information. Like if you can leave our listeners with your top tips for maintaining good musculoskeletal health, your top tips for, I mean, outside of food, obviously, but what, you know, is it exercise? Is it how you exercise? Is it, is it building a relationship with like, what do you think are the best ways for someone to avoid chronic back pain, chronic joint pain, arthritis? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's difficult to give such a broad uh, statement on that because there's so many different aspects to it. But I think one thing you talked about there in resilience that stood out to me, you know, before I maybe go into your last question is that, is that that idea that, um, you know, you have like a little ache and pain or something and you shut everything down. Right. So some of what we do in working out and training and, and other things like stress, even in our jobs or things like that, some of those things are good for you, right? Like in the long run, if you just kind of push through it, ultimately, those are the things that make us stronger and will make us more resilient and accomplish more and more successful in, in various aspects of our life. So I think part of it is, is a mental approach where, you know, it's just not going to feel good hundred percent of the time. First of all, I mean, especially as we get older, I mean, if you could feel good a majority of the time, if you can do everything you want to do, if you could feel good and happy and, and accomplish a lot, then I think that that's, that's important in and of itself. It's just accepting of that reality without wanting more and without having unrealistic expectations because there are a lot of people and it's like, yeah, we can do all these things and you will get better, but there has to be a element of reality to what we're doing. Okay. Now going beyond that, I think movement is critical. Probably the most important thing I've done in my life is exercise. I think um, more than any other uh, one of those tenants that we discussed, I think for people who don't move, again, when we go back to the fluidity of the human body naturally, it's the underlying element of everything, every cell, everything is moving constantly, even, you know, atoms and things like that, right? If we want to get kind of like more... Uh, metaphysical and whatnot, but, uh, so movement is critical 
And there's various ways to do that. Uh, sometimes you need to move less. Sometimes you need to move more. Um, try to move the right amount, right? So that's the key is finding that sweet spot where you're moving uh, enough to maintain, but not too much to do damage, but not too little to do damage either. Um, and then I think the other things that you guys are uh, much more uh, versed in would be, you know, the dietary stuff, nutrition, things like that. Uh, you know, for me, avoiding uh, bad foods, uh, number one, is, is sort of just a simple rule um, and sort of avoiding all of the uh, the elements of our modern lifestyle that are really detrimental to our overall health and well-being. Um, I, I, you know, I think this year uh, of any year, uh, is a breaking point for a lot of people and it's unfortunate, but I hope it sheds a lot of light on, uh, modern human society and how far we've strained from who we are as a species and how much work we have to do to get back to it. But a lot of the things that you guys talk about in the sapien lifestyle and, uh, and promote are, are easy ways to really get back to how we are and, and who we can be and, and ultimately live a much better, healthier, happier life. I love that. And, and the food part, even simple as just saying, don't eat junk food. We don't even have to get into the yeah. saving diet, but people don't even understand that that affects their joints and their all this pain, their arthritis. Yeah. So Michaela Peterson, was. we did the interview with her in this room, just thought of her. She had debilitating arthritis, ankle removed, hip removed, you know, replaced, all this stuff. And it was because of food. Doctors made fun of her and her mom for saying it was to do with what she ate. Yeah, I saw She that. changed her diet and it all went away. So just know it's, it's look her up. You can, you know, she's all yeah. over the place. I mean, there are numerous examples of this stuff. And I think, it, you know, we see these patients, again, we see these patients for a reason because we're offering hope and another option that's outside of the traditional model. And we're giving a, a more nuanced approach a more thoughtful approach. We're discovering things. We're identifying issues that otherwise have not been identified. And we're guiding people in a natural way to improve their quality of life and and feel better. And ultimately, that's what my specialty is really about. You know, with the rehab side of it, I didn't really get into that. But, um, you know, these patients that suffer from strokes and devastating traumatic brain or spinal cord injuries, uh, our specialty is sort of geared at helping these patients readjust and reacclimate and then maximize their quality of life and functionality. And, and that's the same thing I'm doing. And it's the same thing you're doing. And that's just the way that it should be done. Maximize quality of life. I love it. So where do we find you, man? Do you yeah, have wow. a website? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's uh, drbloomdo.com is my, uh, my medical practice website. And uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, just look me up, Matthew L. Bloom Do. And my Instagram handle is at drbloomdo. Where is your clinic? Oh, yeah. So uh, my clinic is in Ventura, California. It's uh, Ventura County, just north of Los Angeles County. And uh, also, um, I'm going to be working more closely in the future at uh, Gary's Clinic in Woodland Hills, California. That's in right. In the LA area. So we're close to the LA area. Um, but you can find me online. And a long time ago, uh, I had my own podcast. Don't go looking for it. <laughs> but Gary was actually a guest on that podcast That's a long, long time ago. I'm not going to tell you the name. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't have my own podcast now like these guys. Full circle, man. All right. <laughs> All right, wow. man. Thank you, yeah, Dr. Man, Bloom, you Mr. Matthew. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please share this episode with friends and family. Give us a review on iTunes and check out everything else we're doing on sapien.org. And we'll see you next time.